Coming up on Tech News Today, Sony unveils a new smartwatch, Microsoft making games for iOS. Bad news for Nokia Blackberry in India. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, June 25th, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by ShareFile. Enhance your workflow, send files of almost any size easily and securely with ShareFile by Citrix. Try ShareFile today. For a 30-day free trial, go to sharefile.com, click the radio microphone, and enter TNT. And by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create a professional website, blog, portfolio, or online store. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase on new accounts, go to squarespace.com and use offer code TNT6. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zakar. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we try to keep you up to date on the most important stories in the world and put them in context for you. Starting with the top 10 stories of the day in the news feeds. Barnes & Noble reported Q4 earnings this morning with revenue down 7.4% year-over-year, a loss of $2.11 per share for the quarter, and revenue down 4.1% for the fiscal year with a loss of $2.97 a share. Book retailer also announced plans to allow a third party to manufacture the Nook tablets in a co-branded partnership. Barnes & Noble will continue to develop its e-ink readers in-house. Oh yeah, it went on sale today and has already sold out at Amazon, though you can find it online or in person at Best Buy, GameStop, Target, or Game, all uppercase. Some of the original Kickstarter backers still haven't received their consoles yet, although founder Julie Ehrman says the firm is working overtime to resolve that issue. The retail Ouya package comes with the game console, controller, an HDMI cable, batteries for $100, and extra controllers running $50. Sony announced its latest smartwatch, and it's called Smartwatch 2. It has a 1.6-inch screen with a resolution of 220 by 176. It's water-resistant and now includes NFC to help the smartwatch 2 pair with any Android phone. Sony also overhauled its watch UI, which is Android-like, but not full Android. The device will launch in September, but there's no info on price. The original Sony smartwatch retailed for about 150 bucks. Nikkei reports Microsoft has reached a deal with Japan's K-Lab to develop Android and iOS versions of Microsoft's first-party PC and Xbox games. The plan would reportedly launch with a free-to-play variant of Age of Empires by the end of fiscal year 2013. BlackBerry just launched its secure workspace app so that organizations can manage and secure Google and Apple devices through BlackBerry Enterprise Services, or BES 10. This way, employees can bring their own devices, it's a big trend these days, but still check their company's calendars, emails, and organizers securely, and IT managers will be able to securely see and manage and update all Android and Apple devices network-wide. Meanwhile, at the European Court of Justice, the mm. Advocate General has told Google that it should not have to delete sensitive information from its search results. The court said the search engines like Google are not responsible for personal data appearing on web pages they process. The court's statements come after a man complained about search results detailing an auction notice on his home. My home's for auction? We'll get our first release of Windows 8.1 preview this week at Build. The conference is going on in San Francisco, but copies of Windows Server 2012 R2 have already begun to circulate with some hints of what we'll see later this week from the client version. As expected, the start button is back and there is an option to boot straight into the desktop. Additionally, users can right click on the restored start button and shut down or restart Windows and the ability to disable the hot corners that brings up charms has been added. Samsung and the European Union's European Commission, which regulates corporate competition, are in early talks to settle an investigation into the company's use of mobile patents, sources tell Reuters. The commission has some qualms with Samsung over its use of standard essential patents in its lawsuits against Apple across the EU, though Samsung agreed it would license them on fair and reasonable terms to any and all companies that requested their use. 
If a settlement is reached, Samsung may not face any fines at all. But if the company decides to fight back, it could end up with $17.3 in fines. Roger Waters, David Gilmore, and Nick Basin of Pink Floyd wrote a USA Today editorial Sunday accusing Pandora's Tim Westergren of deceit for emailing artists to support new internet radio regulations while not mentioning it would mean an 85% drop in royalty payments. Pandora claims current royalties are unfair because broadcast radio pays a much smaller rate. But the real question is, do you side with David Gilmore's Island Mansion or Tim Westergren's $13.9 million stock cash out? Because I don't know about you, but I can identify with both. <laughs> Sprint shareholders approved the proposed purchase of the carrier by Japanese company SoftBank with 98% of the votes cast in support. SoftBank Bank just raised its offer for Sprint to $21.6 billion in cash and stock to counter attempts by Dish to buy Sprint. The companies expect the merger to close early next month, followed by regulatory approval. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by ShareFile by Citrix. In business, we rely on sending and receiving important materials, things like contracts, presentations, detailed confidential documents. There's a lot of risk placing large confidential files online. You, they're too big sometimes to just go as a regular email attachment. And do you just want to throw them in an online box? I don't know. That doesn't sound like a good idea to me. So... Really, you want to guarantee your attachment will go through. You want to know that only the people who need to see it are going to access the files. That's why we use ShareFile by Citrix. It's the better way to send and receive files of almost any size. With ShareFile, you can easily and securely send everything from large documents to PowerPoints. Files are sent as a link, so you don't get bounce backs because email is like, that's too big for me. No, that doesn't happen anymore. Plus, it's easy on the other end. They just click a link. You can track when it's downloaded. A set access to controls so you know it's secure. Plus, ShareFile allows you to store your files in the cloud. The side benefit is you can access them from anywhere. You can laptop, mobile device, work on the go. I use ShareFile a lot when I'm dealing with confidential stuff, and I just want to make sure that only the person who got it got it. And sometimes I just want to make sure the person who says they got it actually did open it up and take a look at it. I want you to try ShareFile with our special offer. Sign up today. Receive a 30-day free trial. No obligation. Go to ShareFile.com. Click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and enter TNT. Remember, visit ShareFile.com. Type in TNT, and we thank Citrix and ShareFile for their support of Tech News Today. Joining us now to discuss the stories of the day, very happy to have Christopher Knoll, editor of the Intuit Small Business blog, back with us today. You're, you're doing some blogging elsewhere as well, right? I am. I recently started writing for PC World. Nice. Uh, three times a week, writing about business and technology. All right. Well, good to have you back, man. Always, always fun to talk with you. Uh, let's start off by talking about Sony's cavalcade of gadgets. We heard about the smartwatch in the news views uh, that has apps, or remote control, your Walkman, has NFC for connecting not just uh, to your phone, but also to your headphones and stuff like that. It's water resistant. They're saying three to four days of battery life and coming in September. But they also... Uh, introduced an Xperia Z Ultra smartphone. That's one of those phablets, what people are calling them, 6.4-inch display, LTE phone, a software keyboard that is meant to be better on a large screen like that, uh, and a couple of Chinese phones, the Xperia C S39H, a dual SIM WCDMA GSM coming to China Unicom, Xperia SP M35T, a TDLTE phone for China Mobile, and they also announced Sony Music Unlimited uh, will now allow downloads on iOS. So, of all of the Sony announcements, Chris, which one is your favorite? <laughs> Definitely the Chinese stuff, of course. You know that's right. My, that's where my island mansion is. But um, God, I mean, who? Why? When is Sony going to finally, you know, get together and uh, put out some products? I mean, come on, just sitting yeah. around sitting on their butts. Do you get excited about the phablet or the smartwatch? Those seems to be the two that are grabbing all the headlines. Today. Yeah, yeah. I well, you know, I'm I'm excited about the prospect of smartwatches actually finally, you know, 80 years after they were envisioned by popular culture becoming something that somebody would actually wear. You know, part of part of our part of the zeitgeist, right? So. Of anything, I think that's that's where I'm seeing the promise is finally starting to to become almost a reality. It's almost something that I would maybe put on my wrist. We'll see. I'm definitely excited about the well, smart, smart I was watch. I going to say, always, it's got to be you, I guess. It's always me who loves the smart watch. I was looking into the smart watch, uh, the original one, for a while, and then I saw that its UI was a mess. Uh, the bezel was huge. The screen was too small. Resolution was low. Battery life wasn't very good, so... 
There was very little going for it other than the fact it existed. But the smartwatch, too, at least promises a lot more than that. I think the three- to four-day battery life could be something that's great. But this idea of having to recharge your watch or whatever wrist device you have, I really dislike that in general. That, that stops me from getting things like the fuel band or anything like that because I know that I'll use it for the first three or four days, but I'm going to forget to charge this after a while, and you don't want your watch dead. Uh, and then well, also— I mean, what, what do you—what's the, what's the alternative? Just— what, like a solar watch that you just never have to think about? Well, I have one of those EcoDrive watches. I wish they could pop one of those kinetic motion uh, uh, power Ooh, supplies yeah. into one of these so I can yeah, keep cool. using it all the time. Maybe to power an e-ink device, really, but not necessarily something like this. Maybe I, maybe I, I one of those wireless sort of... charging systems, too, you know, where you drop it on a tray and it charges overnight. Mm-hmm. Sometimes the three to four battery life can be problematic. I mean, I know with my fuel band that I wore every day for a few months before it died. It was almost just long enough for me to forget that it needed to be charged at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, at least sort of, if you've got something like your, you know, my smartphone at the end of the night, I pretty much just charge it while I'm sleeping. It kind of get, gets you off of that rhythm. So then you end up being like, oh no, my phone or my, my watch just died. I had sort of forgotten about that whole thing. Yeah, the inductive charging, I think, is the, is the solution there, right? Because if you like your smartphone, you plug in your smartphone at night, but at night you just take your wristwatch off and you set it on the bedside. If you just, if you just had a little pad that would charge it there, uh, then three to four days would be more than enough in most cases. Microsoft going to bring some first-party games to iOS, maybe Android as well. What's what's the rumor here, Ayaz? Yeah, like, like you mentioned in the in the news, news Nikkei reports that Microsoft's going to port first-party games of, uh, to iOS and Android. It says Microsoft's working with Japan's K-Lab, and the deal covers both Xbox and PC games, with the first game to be a variant of Age of Empires, which would launch this fiscal year. And Gadget tried to contact Microsoft to see if this is true. Microsoft hasn't responded, but this is this is from a major news source as a rumor right now, I guess. And we've seen you know Office on iOS now. Xbox could hit Xbox games could hit Android. Does this, Chris, does this show a renewed interest in Microsoft just being a software vendor and not trying to dominate the world? Well, I tell you, if you put Age of Empires on my iPad, you will have to rip me apart from it to go to bed at the end of the night. I mean, I, I'm really excited about this possibly happening. Um, and yeah, I think it does a reflection of Microsoft finally saying, you know, look, Windows Phone is not going to dominate the market. We do need to, you know, take advantage of these uh, many awesome properties that we have and leverage them for the money that's in them. I mean, Halo uh, on on Xbox only is a, is a great idea, but what about, uh, I mean, everything's going mobile, iOS, Android, I mean, why? Why ignore that this is a reality that Microsoft is never going to really dominate? I, yeah, I think this, I was trying to think, how does this fit in with Steve Ballmer's supposedly stated plans that Microsoft is becoming a device and services company? Uh, and one of the services they are going to provide, I think, is gaming. I, I think that was really one of the drivers behind the aborted attempt to provide a cloud gaming service for the disc-based games on Xbox One is we want to become... Xbox in the cloud. So whether you're using your phone or your tablet or or your Xbox console, you can play all your games, access all your games, and get all your stuff. Now, they had to back off on that a little bit, but part of it is saying, hey, you're going to have Xbox games available on your phone, whether you have a Windows phone or not. Uh, because I, it makes sense to me that Microsoft would want to try to convince you that, hey, Microsoft is cool. You're playing Age of Empires on your iPad. Maybe when you go for another tablet or another phone, you might consider a Windows phone because they'll have even more of the cool Microsoft stuff. I'm not saying that the, everybody's going to buy that, but I think that's what Microsoft hopes. Yeah, there will always be exclusive content on Microsoft products, but considering how vast and deep you know, Microsoft's library of software is, it just makes sense to try to port some of that to other platforms than Windows Phone or Xbox. And Microsoft tips its hand a while ago with this when they introduced Smart Glass, and that was available for pretty much anything, which that surprised me at the time, too. If these games make it to these other de these other devices, it, I, I'm really curious how internally Microsoft is handling this, because the Windows Phone team must be irritated, because they're not, while they might have exclusive content, they're not getting the same kind of preferential treatment that you'd think they would get by being within Microsoft, that if iOS and Android are going to get these, these great uh, games... What's the appeal of Windows Phone, especially if that's going to stay around for Microsoft? Well, I mean, well, maybe Microsoft realizes that, you know, Windows Phone just isn't going to appeal. To, I mean, there, there are people that Microsoft will not be able to convince. 
uh, to switch over. So why not at least get us hooked on uh, really fun game franchises that at least say, that, so at least in our heads we're like, yeah, you couldn't live without Microsoft. Well, and that's the idea of Google having their stuff on iOS as well. I mean, I don't think the Android folks are extraordinarily irritated that Google makes iOS apps. It's Google trying to say, hey, we want to get as many people as possible, partly for what Sarah's saying, the people who just will never use our <laughs> product. We want to have a contact with them. What's but the profit? What's the profit that Microsoft makes on a Windows phone? And then what's the profit that Microsoft makes on um, a porting of a 15-year-old software title like Age of Empires to uh, iOS? I think that's interesting. You're saying there's a, there's a nice margin? Video. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and I think there's a secondary effect that they're hoping for, too. Like I said, that you swing some of those people over to Windows Phone because they, they start to like Microsoft things. It's, that's a harder effect to measure, unfortunately. Meanwhile, Nokia... One of the Windows Phone standard carriers and BlackBerry, the, the two troubled phone makers we're constantly talking about, running into more trouble in India. Yeah, so India's smartphone market grew exponentially, 74% during Q1 of 2013. So in a very short period, wow, sales of basically low-end Android devices are kind of the key seller um, in, in the Indian market. According to IDC, smartphone sales in India during this quarter reached 6.1 million units with Samsung in the lead as the lead manufacturer taking about 32.7% of sales. Now, what's interesting is you say, okay, well, it's Samsung against you know, Nokia, BlackBerry, I mean, who's number two? Last year, domestic makers, so uh, handsets that are, that are, that are uh, made in India, accounted for 3% of the market. They now account for 30% of the market. There's a local manufacturer, Micromax, uh, which is in second place behind Samsung with 19% of total unit shipments, followed by uh, Carbon Mobile, uh, that's based in Bangalore, with 11%. So you say, okay, well, what about the uh, what, what about the old mainstays? Nokia's market share dropped from 5.6% to 1.2%. BlackBerry uh, fell from 25.5% to 12.3%. So, I mean, it's almost impossible not to say, well, let's see what's going on in China versus India. I mean, two very different markets, but two very large markets. Samsung's number one in China as well. Um, Nokia and, you know, BlackBerry have basically this trend of losing feature phone market share. But as far as smartphones go, it doesn't seem to be, India doesn't seem to be the place where, uh, you know, Nokia in particular is going to surge back. What do we all think? I mean, is it, where's the market for Nokia and, and BlackBerry at this point? You know, where, is it Brazil? I mean, who's next? I hate to say it, the market for Nokia is in making Android phones, apparently, because that's what's happening in both these markets. Yeah. The, the the cheaper, uh, more nimble competitors that are using Android to make phones seem to be winning. And this this was the big hope, especially for Nokia, but but also for BlackBerry, that they could continue to bolster their market share and grow market share in the developing countries where they hadn't been dominated yet by iOS or Android. Uh, or or the or both, and it looks like it's just playing out. At least in the early days, and according to this report, it's playing out the same way it has everywhere else, where the flexibility of Android just helps them take over the market through multiple manufacturers. Yeah, it's worth uh, noting that uh, that uh, the iPhone doesn't even rank in the top five, at least in the Indian market. Um, so it's it's certainly it, it is unique in that way, but. You know, I mean, I as Windows phones. I mean, is there? Well, there's no is that is it just is it pretty much a market that is uh, that that it, that has failed certain uh, certain big companies? I, th I think there's there's nothing wrong with having multiple operating systems on your phone. So you you have uh, you have Samsung. They make everything. That's why they have like thirty was it thirty two percent of the market. So they can go with a low cost Android phone. So they can have high end Android phones, Windows phones, whatever they want. They don't seem to differentiate when it comes to having every single. Uh, OS on there. Nokia already has that Asha line, that feature phone style. It's actually their cheap uh, smartphone slash feature phone. It's not exactly a Windows phone. They could easily come out with an Android version of it. They were talking, they did have that whole Mego experiment. So it wouldn't be that hard to port Android. Although I fear that if Nokia or BlackBerry or these companies try to switch, 
to Android. They're just going to be one of the like hundreds of players. I don't know what unique thing they can bring that's going to bring people over. If they have feature phones that are low cost, that should bring people over. Mm. Chris, do you have a uh, you yeah. have a solution for Nokia here? <laughs> well, Nokia at least has one thing, and that is its brand. You know, Nokia is not a forgotten company, even in um, anywhere in the world. Uh, it was the company that that started the cel cellular rev revolution. And for a lot of these companies, um, they, I mean, a lot of these countries, excuse me. Um, remember, these are these are very sophisticated mobile uh, technology uh, states. Uh, they were on mobile well before we were because they didn't have an old landline infrastructure that they had to uh, get rid of before they could go with cellular. So the challenge uh, over there is not, I think, making really cheap affordable phones. It's, it's making uh, phones that, that people who already know everything there is to know about phones, you know, that want to switch to. So uh, yeah, Nokia has its work cut out for it, but I, I think uh, basically you're right that it's an Android universe and you're going to have to either get on the ball or you're going to have to uh, figure out some other market to tap into maybe more smart smart watches more smart watches or, or or glassware or 3d printers maybe nokia could start making 3d printers that specialize in printing out rubber boots kind of go back to the roots <laughs> <laughs> uh, i don't know i'm just trying to help Let's take a break and thank our other sponsor for today's show, Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create an amazing-looking, reliable website uh, that will show off your blog, your portfolio, your online store in the best possible light. Uh, these templates are exceptionally well-designed. I've said over and over that I, I'm not very good at the designing of things. Uh, I, I do my best, but why would I when I've got Squarespace? If I'm using Squarespace for a site, They've got an award-winning design team. They regularly add new smart features and amazing design templates. The templates automatically adapt to the screen size, not in some quirky, weird, like uh, some kind of crippled mobile version of your site, but a fully functional, good-looking version of your site, whether it's on a 4-inch screen, a 7-inch screen, a 10-inch screen, a laptop, a desktop. Uh, they just released a beautiful new template called Momentum, which has cinematic full-bleed image display. If you're a photographer, uh, this is perfect for designing your work. And of course, you might say, well, that sounds complicated, Tom. You're using multi-syllable words. It's fast and easy to use. Everything is drag, one syllable, drop, one syllable. <laughs> the page builder tool is amazing. I use it for Sword and Laser. I use it for my books website, meritbooks.squarespace.com. It's the best experience that you can get if you want good-looking websites that are reliable and a flexible e-commerce solution to boot. So go, go try it out. Go to squarespace.com. Sign up for a free account. You don't need to give them your credit card or anything. Just try it out. Start building your website. If you decide to purchase it, use offer code TNT6 and get 10% off your first purchase on new accounts. That's monthly plans and annual plans. You get 10% off the whole year. Don't forget about free domain registrations, too, when you buy an annual plan. That's squarespace.com. Use offer code TNT6 everything you need to create an exceptional website. And we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. All right, we got another uh, troubled company to talk about here, Barnes & Noble. We heard their horrible numbers in the news views there and their plan to develop e-ink readers still in-house, but partner with a third party to manufacture the tablets. Uh, they say, here's the quote from, from the statement this morning, we plan to continue to innovate in the single-purpose black and white e-reader category, and the underpinning of our strategy remains the same today as it has since we first entered the digital market, which is to offer customers any digital book, magazine, or newspaper on any device. I, I think that's part of the message that's been lost when we look at Nook tablets is that there is a Nook iOS app and, and there is a Nook Android app. Uh, there's a way to circumvent and put Nook on your Kindle Fire, although Amazon doesn't really like that. Chris, is this a good strategy to sort of not kill the tablet, but kind of have somebody else take a lot of the risk for it and, and really work on selling ebooks? Well, it's a strategy. I mean, remember, Barnes & Noble is a company that has its heritage as a bookstore. You know, it doesn't have a lot of business building very complex mobile technology devices. I mean, it doesn't even have the experience that somebody like Amazon has. I mean, look at look at how they built a, a warehousing company into one of the technology leaders of, of today, and they still have trouble with with uh, e-readers and tablets. Although you know, Amazon started as a book company, right? Right, but I'm also saying that they've had decades, over a decade, dec maybe two decades, to work out 
how they've evolved into a really a technology company. Barnes and Noble has not. I mean, it has it has very strong roots, very deep roots, and and you can see the you can see the growing pains it's had in dealing with Amazon, dealing even with uh, with internet sales. And now this is not really a surprise to me that it can't really make a make a great business out of uh, out of its uh, e-reader tablet device. So I think this is a smart move for them. Um, I don't. I think they need to focus on distribution of content more than hardware. Definitely. It's a smart strategy, but it's sad. You know, Barnes and Noble had that really cool Nook when it first came out. It had the double screen, had Android in in one part of it. They had the most friendly, hackable Android device you could get at this at a certain time, and they had a lead. And the weird thing is, Amazon came in with their own tablets, low cost, and had their own branded version of of Android that nobody seemed to notice was Android, and they won people over just because they had the front page of Amazon.com. Barnes & Noble, this is a great strategy, but I really like the fact that there was a major player out there that had all these deals with book companies. And they could somehow, they were making the media deals too. So the fact that they're not making hardware, that's it's probably smartest, but I'm going to miss seeing their actual hardware because they had some actual unique designs, that stupid little hook for the carabiners. I don't know why you'd have it, but at least they tried. <laughs> Everything else is just the great same. Great for hiking with your e-book. <laughs> same glass slab <laughs> yeah. everywhere. I mean, the Nook was well regarded. I mean, it was, you know, it's, it's, uh, I think it is, I guess, kind of sad also, I, as I agree with you, but at the same time, it's like Barnes and Noble, you equate with books, right? It's always been that way. Yes, Amazon started out as also a book e-tailer, but it has been something else completely different, you know, that's so much broader that sells everything for a long time. So it's like when you really, you know, when you really looked at it, Barnes & Noble could never possibly expect to compete with Amazon because people don't want to use tablets just to read books, even though I understand that it wasn't just about that, you know, an e-reader is different than than the tablet that, that, that Barnes & Noble had put together. That's really hard to convince people because people say, well, I, I mean, I already use Amazon, so that just makes sense because Amazon sells other stuff. So I'll be able to buy that stuff, you know, on this nice tablet that Amazon made. So there's a lot of perception involved here, but I, I don't really see it as a surprise that somebody had to lose eventually. Well, and Money2004 pointed out in the chat room that early on, Amazon's slogan was world's largest store, even when they weren't world's largest store, uh, even in the early days when they were still just coming off being a bookseller. But they've always planned on being more than just a bookseller. Barnes & Noble is going the opposite direction. They just wanted to be a bookseller. And sure, they, they would sell some games and, and CDs and, and things around that same idea, but they never wanted to be the world's largest online store. And now they have to be. Uh, so that's a lot harder to learn uh, when when you're going, they're, they're running into the same transition all these businesses are in, which is we had something that really worked well in the old way of doing things. And now that the internet is here, darn it, it ruined everything. Uh, and some companies make that transition better than others. Speaking of ruining everything, iOS 7 has ruined everything for Snapchat. Oh, no. Yeah, Snapchat is, uh, it's curtains for Snapchat. Not really, <laughs> but it was something kind of interesting uh, that was that was pointed out because people are playing around with iOS 7 beta. just came out for uh, the iPad version. But screenshots in Snapchat are one of these things that you, you can do, but the sender of a photo... Uh, a Snapchat photo will know that you took a screenshot. So it's kind of like, you know, quasi-illegal type of a thing, behavior uh, within Snapchat. Snapchat, of course, is the service where I send you a photo. I say, you can only look at that photo for five seconds, and then it's supposed to sort of disappear into the, into the you know, the internet cloud ether. So in iOS 6, what happened is, I get a Snapchat photo from somebody. I have to hold down my finger for the set amount of time that the sender has given me to look at the photo. If I take a screenshot, it basically closes that photo. The sender gets a, a, a message that I've taken a screenshot of it and then they can you know, figure out what to do from there, stop sending me pictures or whatever. Apparently in iOS 7, that act of sort of closing the, the photo and then letting the person know you took a screenshot does not exist. You can, you can, you know, basically covertly take screenshots and nobody's really getting, you know, the, 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 the message. Now, 
it's not the first screenshot workaround for something like Snapchat. And we should, you know, mention that Snapchat is hugely popular right now. In fact, just yesterday, uh, the company closed a $60 million uh, round of venture funding. The company is now valued at $800 million. It's quite a big deal, especially with, with the younger set. And we've talked certainly on this show about, you know, why, why do people like Snapchat so much? It's just sort of the future of sharing so what do we think? I mean, iOS 7 is still in beta. Is this deliberate on Apple's part? Is Apple, you know, are they in the business somehow of taking the wind out of sales of these companies that are that are that are growing at a crazy pace? Christopher, what do you think? Well, I doubt it's deliberate, but um, you know, I think an operating system has to evolve, and then apps have to evolve um, to deal with the way that the OS works. But um, uh, you know, I, I guess I just am not understanding, you know, why anyone would expect any sort of privacy when sending a photo to somebody. Um, you know, I'm obviously not a Snapchat user or in their target market, but boy, you have to have just a huge leap of faith that there won't be some workaround uh, that, you know, what happens with iOS or any other way, uh, that when you send a photo that you only want someone to see for five seconds, that that is the way it's going to actually pan out. Um, it's, always, it's been like this, th things like this bug me also on the web, you know, where if you go to like the internet movie database, you can't right click and save a, a movie still, but you can take a screenshot of the page and crop it and then save that. You know, it's, 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 uh, these are things that just kind of get in the way of stuff that people actually want to do. And I think Snapchat is going to have to reconcile that with its business plan and with its, with its audience. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Anybody who uses Snapchat and thinks there's no chance that those photos can't be saved uh, has another thing coming because this isn't the only way that you can get at those screenshots. There have been other ways to access the file system and get at them uh, that we've talked about before. So I do wonder, is this deliberate on Apple's part? I was trying to rack my brain all morning thinking, what kind of OS change would they need to, to, to disable that screenshot breaks touch was is there some camera app functionality where you want to be like zooming a picture in the camera that will snap back and so you want to be able to somehow how you know bend your fingers to do the screenshot while your fingers are still on the screen i just i don't know i maybe it, it does seem a little weird that this is a change in ios 7 because i'm not sure what the other benefit is of this function. I think iOS 7 allows you to do digital zoom while you're doing a when you're recording a video, so maybe that's, yeah, that's true. the actual that's thing true. that's oh, causing okay. this, but I would seriously doubt that Apple is trying to break the, this uh this old thing. I'm sure that Apple just wanted to do something for itself and they wanted to do uh, enable themselves to uh have this functionality. I'm just figuring that you're going to see this this story pops up, there's going to be all kinds of backlash. There's the people using iOS 7 right now on the beta should know better what's going on because there's this little thing. If, if you're using iOS 7, uh, you can take screenshots and iOS 6 users wouldn't know. So it, it's, it's still a beta product. So once it comes out, that's really what I'm curious about. Will this still be there by the end once iOS 7 launches sometime in, what, the, in the fall? Yeah, my guess is not. I, I, I think you're right, Ayaz, I, I, and that's a pretty good guess for what this would be for. Apple doesn't do things to mess with other apps. They don't even do things, I, think, I don't think, to mess with jailbreak. They just don't try to take into account things that aren't important to Apple, and so that's why this happened. And yeah, Snapchat will probably adapt by the time iOS 7 comes to everybody. Let's finish up with Ooh Yeah, going out into the retail stores. I still don't have mine, by the way. And you were uh, a backer, I, right, Tom? I try, yes. Uh, this is a very important point. You're, when you're <laughs> backing on Kickstarter, you're not buying hardware. Uh, because I, I backed, but I tried to send a change of address twice before they sent me my Ooh Yeah, and they still sent it to my old address. And I haven't been able to resolve it. They were very helpful at first. Now they've become sort of unresponsive. Uh, and I guess the, the Ooh Yeah that I purchased is still sitting at my old house. And they, they, they were saying, can't you get somebody to go by there and i'm like well i don't live there anymore uh, no one i know lives close to there any anyway uh let's what so oh yeah in stores yay they're in stores so tom if you really want to go get one i think you can uh order it on uh bestbuy.com or Ouya's own website. Again. If you want to pay again, yeah. You, this is how you'll actually get it. So it's sold out at GameStop, Amazon, and Target. Uh, at least that's when I checked it this morning. The console was originally scheduled to hit retailers on June 4th. Uh, today was the actual launch. And when you get the device, if you ever do, <laughs> you get an HDMI cable, controller, batteries, and the actual Ouya. Early backers like Tom do not have, not every early backer has their Ouya yet. 
And TechCrunch reported that uh, Ouya's head, Julie Ehrman, sent an update to backers apologizing for not getting the consoles out to them. And then the update also blames Ouya's distribution partner, DHL. They're to blame for this, <laughs> not necessarily Ouya. And Sasha Sagan over at PC Mag wrote up a scathing article titled, How Ouya Shows Kickstarter Sucks for Hardware, Advising People to Not Purchase Electronics on Kickstarter. He cited a CNN money study uh, from last year that showed 84% of the top 50 mega projects missed their delivery dates. Christopher, is Ouya's lateness and this, this uh, retail uh, availability, is this going to actually impact Kickstarter as well? Well, it doesn't seem so seem to so far, um, and I would I would argue that um, Kickstarter the, it's not just the mega projects that are late; it's almost every project that's late. Um, everything I've ever backed on Kickstarter has either never materialized or is still in production or is still late. And these are not complex hardware product projects; they're movies or music or things like that. And uh, you know, I, I think Kickstarter <laughs> gives the entrepreneur or the artist behind something. Um, just this immense amount of freedom to do what they want. You know, there's no there's no uh, consequences for missing a deadline on Kickstarter. Uh, there's no uh, there's no consequences of never really delivering your product at all. I mean, you are supposed to give back the money, but uh, oftentimes, as you've seen many times in the past, that doesn't happen. So, yeah, it seems like a black mark for Kickstarter, but it has not slowed the rate uh, by which people are just handing over their money for stuff that sounds really cool. And with a product like Ouya, which is only $99, I mean, that is right there in the sweet spot of where a gamer is willing to uh, take a risk. And uh, as you see, you know, people, people get into Kickstarter projects. They don't have any experience in the market they're in. They just had a cool idea. They think, hey, maybe I'm going to give this a go. And um, 80, what is it, 86% of the time, it's, uh, it's not exactly panning out the way they, uh, the way they expected. I'm shocked. Does this, do companies like Kickstarter and these crowdfunding places do they need to impose penalties? Because right now in their FAQs, they don't. Kickstarter doesn't do anything about this. They <laughs> expect you to research the the uh, project founder to see if they're legitimate enough for you to give them their money, which puts the onus on the backer. Should Kickstarter have to do penalties for something like this? Interesting. I mean, kind but, of. In a situation oh. like this, Ouya got so much attention based on the original Kickstarter fundraising project. I mean, that's what drew a lot of awareness to this project in the first place. And for the early backers to be like, well, wait a second. I was like one of the first hundred people to give you money to make this a reality. Now it's a reality. And I still don't have some console that somebody can go to Best Buy and get. I mean, I'd be really mad too, because that's the whole point of Kickstarter. It's the perk of being one of the first people who believes in somebody's dream. Well, so, the, the, you know, maybe there shouldn't be an across the board penalty, financial penalty to a company like Ouya that's obviously, you know, selling out of a product that people really want. But it certainly is disappointing. And maybe that's something that, maybe that's something that should be built in to a promise to, to, to your, to your early backers is, Hey, when this comes to market, if for whatever reason we've got assembly line issues, we can promise that you know, your neighbor down the street who only heard about it yesterday isn't going to jump in line ahead of you. It just, it's just bad mojo, really. And Kickstarter itself really tries to combat this idea that Kickstarter is a store. So if, if a product is late, that no, there should not be penalties for that. The point of Kickstarter, I, I disagree with you a little bit, Sarah, point of Kickstarter should be, I believe in this idea and I would like to give some money to see it become reality. Yes, it's nice that I should, you know, as a reward for that, I should get a perk. But the main point is I want it to come out. Now, if a Kickstarter never delivers a project, then I think you have a better case for talking about some sort of penalty if you don't deliver on your response. But even then, Kickstarter's saying this is development. When VCs back companies, sometimes they fail before they ever ship a product. So you're acting in that respect. I think it's just a learning curve we're on that, hey, crowdfunding is great, but crowdfunding carries the same risks that microfunding carries, but which is sometimes on. the companies don't fulfill VC, their obligations. If you're a VC, you are not backing a company because you believe in them. You're backing a company because you get a piece of it and you think you're going to make a good return on your investment. Sure. No, there this are is definitely just, differences. I want my console that I paid you but for. But it shouldn't be I want my console. It's a middle ground. It's I, I believe in this concept, right? That's why people are giving money to Veronica Mars. Not because they're going to own the movie, but because they want to see the movie made. Uh, and there's lots of projects like that where there isn't a product, but people want to see it happen where that's clear. But when you have a product and the product is the perk, the waters start to get muddied.
Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Hey. yeah. Good luck with that Kickstarter. Know, Kickstarter. Kickstarter's got an interesting <laughs> problem though, because now, I mean, I agree there should be some sort of a some sort of consequence for missing deadlines or or not shipping product. I mean, the companies that run off with millions of dollars that's a that's a that's a big problem, and I think people who support those projects have a right to be mad about it. But now Kickstarter, I mean, Kickstarter does not want to do that. They want to take their 5% and be done. They want to be completely hands-off, not culpable in any problems that happen in, in, uh, in that process. Uh, and now they have to compete. You know, they have, uh, there are now dozens of, of crowdfunding platforms. And so if they start meddling with the process and start putting in penalties and putting in, uh, you know, hurdles that these companies have to overcome, uh, that becomes a that becomes a real challenge to try to get somebody to say, well, yeah, I should go with Kickstarter instead of Indiegogo because because you know I don't want to have that hassle. I just want to take my I just want to have the easiest route to getting the money that I think I need to to make the product I'm trying to build. All right, let's move on to the randomizer. Ejar Goffrey has created a bicycle out of nine dollars worth of cardboard. And it is awesome. Uh, th there's an Indigo Indiegogo, one of the competitors to Kickstarter. Uh, Indiegogo campaign aims to launch the unusual bike to the world. It's made of cardboard but can hold up to 400 pounds, uh, is both fire and water resistant, uses recycled cardboard along with a little bit of plastic for certain parts and rubber. Uh, in fact, it's recycled rubber for the tires as well. Anybody going to ride this? They, they want $2 million to be able to make this a reality. Does it run Android? <laughs> An Android could ride it because it's up to 400 pounds. It had to be a 400 pounder or, or lower weighing Android. I could see these riding around downtown San Francisco all over the place and it being just kind of like a cool thing for the the fixie crowd to to happen to have. You know. Oh, it's totally fixie crowd. Is this like yeah, a disposable right. bike? Like you could buy a pack of five of them or something? Right. <laughs> no, but that's <laughs> the thing, right? The first, just, just, here's what here's I don't understand. One. <laughs> the first one, you, you have to make a $290 pledge. Mm -hmm. And granted, we just talked about how, yeah. you know, backing one of these is not bu buying. But usually the price of the backing level is only slightly above the cost of the bike. Does that mean the bike's going to be over $100 when it's made out of $9 worth of cardboard? Yeah, but it's really, yeah. really good cardboard. <laughs> well, it is. I mean, I mean labor, if it's... Labor that goes into yeah, it is yeah. far higher than $9, yeah. Yeah, well, there you go. That's true. All I, right, I, I just don't... I, I, it's, like, it's like the physics of this are, are baffling to me. Cardboard holding up to 400 pounds. Water resistant? Well, you're, yeah, just don't flies think of the in the cardboard. face of everything I know about cardboard. Think of the cardboard that comes uh, with your produce, right? If you ever have you ever picked up boxes behind a grocery store and you get that really thick, like wax-covered cardboard sure. that the oranges come in, it's stuff uh -huh. like that. It's 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 not flimsy. I'm I'm guessing. I'm totally guessing. I have no idea what I'm talking about. Four hundred pounds is a lot of weight, Tom. It's they've I'm obviously be going done... up against the muni buses. I really want a sturdy uh, bike. True. Good point. Because yeah, because Sarah Lane no, but they've orders done, on four hundred pounds. No. Like, I don't think this is an issue. Do so you doubt that they actually are? Do you think they're lying about that? Or do you, I, 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 think, I don't think they're, no, I don't think they're lying about okay. it. I think, I think it sounds amazing. I, I would love a, a bike that didn't feel flimsy and yet was um, nice and light and, and, you know, able to, I don't know, maybe put on a rack type of a thing. I mean, I, I live in a city, so the whole bike thing is very problematic because a lot of people don't have a lot of space and you got to have a bike in your apartment. And I like the idea of all of this. Um, I just, you know, I, I also get scared about bikes that aren't as resistant to the elements as, as they might like to be. Well, the, they're saying, and I guess we should wait till we see one, but they're saying this is resistant. It's strong and, and resistant to the elements. That's, yeah. that's what's so amazing. I don't know. It also Let's says it's look. fire resistant. How would that work? That's Every where the plastic comes burn. in. It's made of unicorns oh, and cardboard. I didn't say it was fireproof. Fire resistant. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can ride through a fire just very quickly. <laughs> Glance the fire. fire. Uh, yes. <laughs> let's look at the calendar. Oh, let's. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Microsoft's Build Conference is starting tomorrow, the twenty sixth, and runs through Friday, the twenty eighth, uh, in San Francisco. Also tomorrow, Google's going to start offering unlocked Samsung Galaxy S4s with stock Android for $649. 
Tomorrow is actually a big day. Also happening tomorrow, Digs Google Reader replacement beta officially opens. I've actually seen a few people who are already using it. Also tomorrow, the HTC One Google Edition is launching for $599. And if you'd like to look ahead into July, iFixit has declared July 1st through the 5th Liberation Week and is going to give away 1,776, get it, 1776 iPhone Liberation Kits. Yeah, unlock your iPhone. Very nice. Let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. I think we got a message from the one and only Jonathan Strickland, or one of many, actually. Hey, TNT. <laughs> regarding the flip face discussion on episode 781, I think the main motivation for Facebook to make a flipboard-like product is to crack the nut on mobile advertising. Maybe they think a magazine layout will make ads more attractive and get more engagement. We know there's a massive migration trend to mobile and that Facebook, despite its billion users, hasn't been able to monetize mobile efficiently. Just a thought. Yeah, no, I think I think John's absolutely right here. I, I he Facebook is improving its mobile monetization. Last earnings report, they were they were pointing some very positive signs, but they still would like lots of different ways to bulk up on that and increase that. I think he's I think he's nailed it. Got another email from Kyle in Jacksonville, Florida, who says, just listen to your Monday show, and I actually got very excited about Google Mine. When I originally read the story, I thought it was pretty lame, couldn't think of a use case, but then after listening to what Tom said, it got me thinking, what if everything I owned in my home was backed up on Google Mine? I'd have a catalog of everything I own, which could be useful, but it would be very cool if, let's say, a friend in my Google Plus circle is searching for an item that I own. Since we're in the same circle, he or she could be notified that I own that item, either to buy the item or to ping me about feedback. Wouldn't it be great if friends of yours could say, hey, Tom, I really need a new waffle maker. I see you have one. Would you be willing to sell it? And then the whole transaction could take place using Google Wallet. It could be the future of eBay of an eBay type system for Google. Also taking what one step further, you could put items up for sale easily because all the data is already online and you could keep them private to just those Google Plus circles or make them public. I got really excited about this idea and I wanted to get your feedback. I feel yeah, like that's kind of what we kicked around is uh, possible. Yeah. I like uh, that. I like yesterday. that. It, it prompted me, Sarah, to think, uh, what if I want to borrow an item or lend an item, right? Somebody borrows your weed whacker. Google could keep track of that. And you could know, like, hey, uh, Ray, you borrowed the weed whacker. Uh, looks like 39 days ago, according to Google Mine. When you when are you going to hand that back? Or if you just want, even if you don't care about getting it back, just knowing, like, who has that book that I lent out? The it circle kind of, of thieves you'd have, and then you'd have, like, your Google Cal invites or, or, or reminders to tell but, you, hey, by the way, on Google Calendar, return Tom's Weed Whacker. Return it. And is there just, honor among a circle of thieves? Um, some. Yeah. I, I like it. I'm starting to like the Thank you, Kyle. You've opened my eyes to Google Mine. Uh, yes. Inventory, the next frontier. I still need it to be. <laughs> I, I still need it to happen automatically. That's the thing. Yeah. Right? I just, I need the Google Glass scanner. That's all. All right. That is it for this episode. Christopher Knoll, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, let folks know what, what you're up to, where they can find your work, PC World, Intuit, all the different places. Oh, you're muted. There we go. There PC we go. World and Intuit, those are the places to go. Blog.intuit.com or just the PC World homepage. You'll see my stuff there uh, three times a week. Excellent. Check it out, folks. Go go take a look. It's good stuff. Also, uh, don't forget to submit stories at our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com, place to let us know what stories you'd like us to discuss, uh, not only by submitting links, but also voting up or down on the other links that have been submitted as well. You can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us tnt at twit.tv and give us a call. Leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. We'll be back tomorrow with Stuart Miles as our guest. We'll see you then.